Welcome to Pharmacology by Lecturio. My name is Dr. Praveen Shukla. Let's talk about some antibacterial agents that we use commonly in practice. Now, when we talk about antibacterial agents, we have a very large spectrum of medications. Let's start off with cell wall synthesis inhibitors. These include the penicillins, the cephalosporins, the carbapenems, and other miscellaneous drugs. When we take a look at these agents, there's there's quite a large variety within each subgroup. With the penicillins, we have penicillinase susceptible and penicillinase resistant agents. Within the cephalosporins, we have first, second, third, fourth, and fifth generation of cephalosporins. Carbapenems are a relatively new uh, group of drugs that have come onto the market recently. And then we have miscellaneous drugs. These can include astreonam and vancomycin. Let's start off with the penicillins. So remember that penicillins uh, are active on the cell wall. Now the cell walls, you can see them here, they have sites that are, amen uh, that are amenable to transpeptidation. This allows cross-linking of the components of the wall. And when you have cross-linking, you have a stronger wall. Now cross-linking is created or facilitated by proteins that act on those peptidoglycans of the cell wall and links them together, much like a zipper does. Penicillins have a beta-lactam ring that binds to that protein. And for this reason, the proteins are called penicillin-binding proteins. So a penicillin-binding protein is where the penicillin is going to be active. Now, if you inhibit the penicillin-binding protein, autocatalysis of the cell wall will occur and the cell wall will break down. Now, the bacteria have developed de defense mechanisms against the penicillins. So some bacteria have beta-lactamase enzymes. They're also called pe penicillinases in other parts of the world. Now these beta-lactamase break down that beta-lactam ring. This is the mechanism of most types of resistance, and they're countered by the inhibitors of these enzymes. So clavulonic acid is an agent that inhibits the beta-lactamase. Now, we use that in combination with amoxicillin, and we sell it as amoxicillin clavulonate. Sublactam is another beta-lactamase, and we sometimes combine that particular uh, uh, agent with ampicillin, and we sell ampicillin sub sublactam. And tazobactam is the third one, and for example, we'll combine it with piperacillin as piptazo. Now, there are other mechanisms of resistance uh, that bacteria will have against penicillin. Sometimes there's actually a structural change in the penicillin binding protein, which renders immunity or resistance to penicillins. This is actually the mechanism of methicillin resistance, and it's become a real problem in our hospitals. Sometimes there's actually a change in the porin structure of the outer wall. So for example, the resistance of pseudomonas to penicillins is a great example. The uh, penicillin isn't able to penetrate because there's a change in the porin. Now, we'll talk about some narrow spectrum uh, penicillins that are out there. Methicillin, nafcicillin, and oxacillin are narrow spectrum agents. They're not used much anymore. I remember when we started medicine, we used to use methicillin all the time. Methicillin-resistant staphylococcus has essentially taken methicillin off the table in terms of our choice because the, these MRSAs are resistant to all penicillins. Methicillin is also linked to interstitial nephritis. Nafcicillin is associated with neutropenia. So these agents are falling out of favor, but they still do show up on our susceptibility charts. Now, ampicillin and amoxicillin you're probably quite familiar with. In fact, I would bet that at least some of you have been on these medications yourselves. These are wide-spectrum agents, but they are still susceptible to beta-lactamases. They are enhanced when combined with clavulonate, and in, entero in enterococcal infections, ampicillin is complementary with aminoglycosides. So in enterococcal infections, we'll often use combinations like ampicillin and gentamicin because they work very well together. That's called bacterial synergy, and I'm going to mention it again when I talk about gentamicin. 
Piperacillin and ticercillin are uh, stronger agents. These are very strong agents against gram-negative organisms. And once again, they are very complementary with aminoglycosides. So piperacillin, for example, will be combined with tobramycin to give a very strong gram-negative uh, treatment. Once again, these drugs are susceptible to the penicillinases, so we often combine drugs like piperacillin with tazobactam to limit the resistance. Let's talk about cephalosporins. Now, we divide the cephalosporins into first, second, third, and fourth generation. And in general, the first generation are more gram-positive active, and the fourth generation tend to be more gram-negative, and there's a spectrum in between. Now, cefazolin and cephalexin are first-generation agents. They're gram-positive active, and they're very useful in surgical infections because a lot of surgical infections come from Staph aureus and uh, other skin surface agents. There's minimal effectiveness of these drugs against gram-negative bacteria. The second generation is the prototypical agent is cefotetan. They are much more active against gram-negative. And what's interesting is they'll often work again, also work against Haemophilus influenzae, which is one of the major causes of pneumonia in many of our patients. Other agents are in this group include cefuroxime. Now, if you notice very carefully, I've underlined two of the agents. I've underlined cefotetan and I underlined cefuroxime. These are the drugs you need to know. Cefuroxime is commonly used in pneumonia treatment. The third generation agents are more gram-negative active. Once again, I've underlined two of them, cefotaxime and ceftriaxone. Cefotaxime is kind of our go-to drug. It's a very very good gram-negative agent. It will often work against organisms that are resistant to penicillin. We only use these drugs in serious infections, and in general, they're only available in intravenous form. Let's move on to the fourth generation cephalosporins. So cefepime is your prototypical agent, and notice that I've underlined it because it's a drug that I want you to know. These are more resistant to the beta-lactamases, and they're also active against Enterobacter, Haemophilus, and Neisseria. Ceftaroline has activity in infections caused by methicillin-resistant staphylococci, so we sometimes use it in that case. Now, remember that the cephalosporins are less likely to cause rashes and allergic reactions when compared to the penicillins. Penicillin seems to be associated quite heavily with rash and other allergic activity. There are two new fifth-generation cephalosporins called ceftarolin and ceftobiprol. Please note that ceftarolin used to be called an unclassified cephalosporin. I mentioned it in the fourth generation segment. These drugs are not yet available in all countries. The definition of the fifth generation is not agreed upon by all countries, but in the USA it is commonly accepted. These drugs are similar to the third generation cephalosporins with respect to a broad spectrum activity against gram-negative bacteria. They are as good as the third generation cephalosporins in this regard. They have activity against gram-positive bacteria, including MRSA, as good as vancomycin or as trionam. Ceftarolin is approved for use in community-acquired pneumonia and skin and skin structure infections. Ceftobiprol binds to PBP2B in MRSA. It is approved for use in hospital-acquired pneumonia and community-acquired pneumonia. It is an intravenous drug only. Other beta-lactam drugs include astreonam. Now, this is not commonly used in clinical practice, and you don't hear much about it. It is a drug that you need to know. Why? Because it's resistant to beta-lactamases, which is huge. There is no activity against gram-positive drugs with this particular agent. It binds to penicillin binding protein type 3, or PBP3. The half-life is prolonged in renal failure, so you can adjust your medication uh, accordingly. Adverse events include GI upset, vertigo, headache. But the nice thing is, is once again, it's resistant to beta-lactamases, and there's no cross-allergy with the penicillins. 
Let's move on to the carbapenems. So uh, these are the kind of gorillacillins, we like to call them. They're very, very powerful agents. The prototypical agent is imipenem, and there are new ones out like miropenem that uh, are taking over. You notice that I've underlined imipenem and miropenem. These are chemically unique but still containing a beta-lactam ring. They have low susceptibility to the penicillinases. They are very susceptible to renal de, uh, di dehydropeptidases, though. So you are going to be administering them with psilostatin, which is an inhibitor of that particular enzyme. They have a wide-ranging activity against gram-positives, gram-negatives, anaerobes, and most importantly, against pseudomonas. Uh, also, acinobacter species are very uh, responsive to carbapenems. So remember that sometimes we have acinobacter type infections in endocarditis, so we, we use it certainly in that regard. Let's talk about vancomycin. So vancomycin is kind of an interesting one. It, uh, it binds to a bacterial glycoprotein on the alanine surface of the peptidoglycan. So we've kind of magnified the peptidoglycan here. It... Uh, the resistant organisms to vancomycin have an alter, altered terminal, so there's a decreased affinity for the vancomycin. In this case, the vancomycin is the yellow uh, little star-shaped thing that you see there. We only use vancomycin for very serious infections. Now, vancomycin, despite the fact that we've magnified things and it looks like a small molecule, it's actually quite a large molecule, and it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you have, say, a spinal infection or a, or a brain infection, we administer it intrathecally. We use it orally, however, for luminal infections of the gut because it's not absorbed across the gut wall, so it stays inside the gut. And if you have an infection inside the gut, it's, it's quite effective. The important toxicity that I want you to remember with vancomycin and that I guarantee you'll be tested on is something called red man syndrome. This somewhat sexist uh, term applies equally to men and women, by the way. It causes severe cutaneous flushing from histamine release. So it's, it's quite a dramatic and uh, quite uh, noticeable sort of reaction. And at first you think it's a, it's a type of uh, horrible allergy. It's not quite an allergy in the same sense. It's actually a histamine release. It can also cause phlebitis, autotoxicity, and nephrotoxicity. So this is a potentially toxic agent. Let's talk a little bit about bacitracin. It's not often covered in uh, antibiotic lectures because we tend to forget about it, but it's, it's, it's used uh, tremendously in hospitals. It's used as a topical treatment and decontamination uh, treatment for things like methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So you'll often see patients being treated with bacitracin in hospital. Uh, it's used in staphylococcus colonization of the skin, now, it can cause nephrotoxicity, so it's not used orally or parentally. Uh, we only use it topically uh, from pra for practical purposes. Daptomycin is a cyclic lipo lipopeptide. It is for the treatment of vancomycin-resistant enterococcus and vancomycin-resistant staphylococcus aureus. You have to monitor creatinine levels very closely uh, uh, sorry, CK levels very closely during treatment. And that's because daptomycin is very myopathic, and so it can cause severe muscle disease. <music> <music>